Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. How appropriate. The day of the world celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Of course, we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ every first day of the week as the New Testament instructs us to. From John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, we read, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark. Huh. Hadn't really noticed that so much before. And saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Beautiful passage. Kind of compacted, though because there's a whole lot of activity that goes on there that the other uh, synoptic gospels tell us about that kind of explains it and explodes it into a whole lot of meaning for us. The death of Christ was essential for our atonement, but his resurrection is the foundation of our hope for eternal life. If he had just died upon the cross, for our sins, what would that have done for us? We'd just died and we'd still have nothing, right? We'd just be, we'd die forgiven of our sins. But it's the resurrection that gives us the hope of eternal life because of the forgiveness of sins. Eternal life is what we desire. Eternal life is what we crave. Because, I don't know, it, it, it's hard to imagine not having life. It's hard to imagine what death is and non-existence would be. I, I don't know. I think that's one of the things that separates us from the animals. We just can't imagine what non-existence would be. So what purpose would the sacrifice of Jesus accomplish if it was only to satisfy God on account of our sins? We'd simply be acquitted or die acquitted of sin guilt, but the grave would be our inheritance, the same as it would be for the unrighteous, so to speak. Now, that's what some religious groups teach, that even if you go to their religious group, uh, and be a part of it. You just live for a thousand years on a rejuvenated earth, and after that, you just cease to exist. Why would you want to be a part of that group? I'd rather have eternal life. The resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of our hope of eternal life. And we want to look at some of the testimony about that eternity-changing event. And John provides three key witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, uh, the Apostle Paul writes, this is the third time I'm coming to you, every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So if, if you want to prove something, you know, the best way to do it is have two or three witnesses. Just, it's not of your own word, but hey, two or three witnesses helps to support it, especially if you're talking about in a court of law back in those days. So, uh, what are the, who are the three witnesses that John provides as key witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus? Well, number one, Mary Magdalene. Because she and the other women were going, she's the first one to find the tomb empty. She and the other women were going to the tomb to spice the body of Jesus. Remember, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had uh, bound the wounds of Jesus, put him in the tomb, and later uh, these women were going to come and do uh, basically not so much an embalming but the process putting the spices there so that the body as it decayed the the smell would not be terribly bad i guess 
would say. But uh, they expected to be able to get in there and do that work. And they were concerned about the heavy stones. So Mary, as they're traveling, she runs ahead to see if she could persuade someone to roll the stone away from them. Well, who would she persuade to roll the st stone away? Well, a gardener would probably be there, but the soldiers for sure would be there. Uh, she could maybe persuade a couple of them to roll the stone away. The soldiers were there, but they were frozen with fear because an angel had come down and rolled the stone away after Jesus had been raised from the dead. Now remember, this is still dark. It's before daylight, so it would be before actually Sunday morning. It, it, it would be Sunday, and it, it's the first day of the week because that began at 6 o'clock the evening before for them, but it was still in the dark when, when this was happening. So finding the tomb empty, she didn't have to have anybody roll away the stone, the angel had done it, she stooped and looked in and saw that it was empty. But Mary was not certain about what was really happening. She was kind of confused. She thought somebody had taken the body. So in verse 2 of John chapter 20, she ran away. She, she ran to tell Simon Peter and John, the other disciple whom Jesus loved, they'd taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know. She and the other women, they, we don't know where they've laid him. So in John chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, she's still confused. She goes back to the tomb. Uh, Peter and John have rushed down there. The other women that were with her have gone to the tomb. They've headed back. You put all the uh, accounts together, you find that this is what is happening. She starts back to the tomb. Peter and John have gone there. They've examined it. They're scratching their heads. They're leaving. She gets back to the tomb. She's still confused, not believing that Jesus is risen. She needs to see the body. And as she's weeping, Jesus comforts her. And Mary, Mary, why are you weeping? And hearing his voice, she believes. But, you know, at first she's thinking it's the gardener. In verse 16, she wasn't concerned about how he was raised. But how did you do this? You know, what what was the process? You know, was it a magic trick? You know, what what's going on here? She just simply rejoiced because what Jesus had been raised from the dead. Now the second witness was John. That John uses the apostle John is Peter. And in John chapter twenty verses three through seven, after Mary tells. Uh, Peter and John, they go to the tomb. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple, John, who apparently was younger than Peter, gets down there ahead of him, reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he, that's John, saw the linen cloths lying there. But he did not go in. What linen cloth was that? That was the cloth that was used to bind the wounds of Jesus. And But he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and boom, right into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in place by itself. Now, if you get the picture of that, here's the beer lying there where the body was wrapped in these clothes. The, the face cloth was there and the bandages over. And here are the cloths still laying there like the body just come up out of it. But over here is the face cloth laid in a separate place. That's what they saw. Now, and again, hearing the words of Mary, Peter ran with the other apostle to the tomb. He entered, Peter entered the tomb first, found the linen gray cloths of Jesus lying on the beard, uh, still wound as if they contained a body, but the body of Jesus was gone. The napkin which had placed over the face of Jesus was folded and laid in another place. 
Luke 24, 12 tells us Peter left the tomb wondering just what had taken place. In other words, how could that be? His faith would not be full until after Jesus appeared to him. Third witness here, and the Apostle John speaks of his own discovery of the empty tomb. In verses 8 and 9, John chapter 20, Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. He believed that Jesus was raised in the, from the dead, but look at verse 9. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And, and as many times as Jesus had talked to them about it, still didn't understand it. Now, he believed he's been raised from the dead because he had seen resurrections before, right? And uh, just a little while back, he had seen Lazarus raised from the dead. So he knew that it had happened, but he just didn't understand biblically what this meant. But he didn't have to wait to see the resurrected body. He was certain that Jesus was risen from the dead, though he and the rest of the disciples did not understand the scriptures prophesying the resurrection. That, that would come later. So there is also testimony of others concerning the resurrection of Christ from the historical perspective. Some things we are not told indicate its actuality. Okay? Some things were just not told, but you know probably had to happen. Many would visit the tomb that day and each would have to resolve what happened. Okay? Now I talked about the, the soldiers who were guarding the tomb who had been there since the first day and because of the earthquake and the angel coming down and rolling away the stone from the tomb, they were there frozen with fear. And after Mary comes and possibly after Peter and John come, uh, some of them go back and they tell the chief priests and tell others, hey, this is what happened. <laughs> and by the way, the body's gone. Well, what are people going to do? Pilate would need to investigate the broken seal around the opening of the tomb. That'd have to be investigated. That'd have to be reported up the chain, right? Clear to Caesar. And that's where some of the writings and stuff that uh, uh, some of the, uh, we'll call it church historians, talk about uh, goes up to uh, Caesar. Uh, military leaders would need to investigate the soldiers who guarded the tomb. In other words, they'd have to talk to each one of them and get their story. And did the, is the story straight? Of course, the Jewish leaders would have to see for themselves what was happening, and of course, there became a conspiracy. Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 through 15 we won't go there, but it tells of the conspiracy, government, military, and priesthood to lie, saying that the disciples stole the body. Well, the disciples weren't going to steal the body. They were hiding in fear that they were going to be taken next and crucified. So if the empty tomb and absence of a dead body, uh, or the, the empty tomb and absence of a dead body witness to the resurrection of Jesus. Because if, if somebody had taken it, they'd have found that body. And when on the day of Pentecost, when Peter was preaching that he is risen and we are all witnesses of it, somebody would have thrown that body out there and said, you're a bunch of frauds. Here's the body. But nobody was able to produce the body of Jesus because he was raised from the dead. Later, Jesus gave evidence of his resurrection to Thomas. In John chapter 20, verse 24 through 29, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. That was the first evening after his resurrection. Now, understand the word evening is used there. Hoopsis. 
has two meanings in the Greek. All right? It can mean afternoon, which would be from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock, or evening, which is 6 o'clock to 6 in the morning, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. All right? So you've got to look at the context. And when it says evening here, you're probably talking about early or late in the afternoon, but not what the Jews would call uh, Monday night. That would come before Monday day. You follow me along here? That helps in understanding some of the things that are going on before the crucifixion of Jesus when you talk about evening. Verse 25. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. And he said, Unless I see them in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now, eight days later, which would be on the next first day of the week, right? His disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked and Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and place it in my side. Wow. Here's a body walking around with a mortal wound in the side and saying, Put your hand in here. Can you imagine that? Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas said, I answered him, My Lord my, and my God. Jesus said to him, You have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. We don't have to see the body of Jesus. We believe the testimony. And we become blessed in that. So and finally, the Apostle Paul recounted several appearances of the resurrected Jesus to witnesses. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Okay, so then once they understood what the Scriptures taught about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, now it all begins to make sense to them. And also to the Apostle Paul, who learns it by revelation, right? Verse 5, And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. That was probably on a mountain in Galilee, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Hey, they're still alive. You can go down there and check with them if you don't believe me, Paul signed. It reading between the lines. Okay? Verse 7. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Well, when was that? That was right before he ascended into heaven, wasn't it? Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. That was on the road to Damascus, at least, and we don't know what happens in that three-year period, or that time uh, after Damascus when he goes into Arabia and how he gets all this revelation, but, 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 last of all. Okay? Now, we know that in the book of Revelation, John sees him by visions, visions, but not personally. So if somebody today tells you that they've seen Jesus literally, Paul says, wrong. Paul says, wrong. Okay, so when we put the resurrection into perspective, we can see two characteristics to which the Apostle Paul alludes. First is the negative. You speak a negative thing about the resurrection. Well, listen to what's said here. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 19. Paul says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. 
then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ support one another. The death of Christ was necessary for the forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of Christ supports that. It, it shows that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, but it also supports the concept of eternal life. That's the negative aspect of it. You don't believe in a resurrection? You may as well forget about eternal life. You have no hope. See the point there? Negative. The second is positive. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. There is an existence waiting later when all who are raised from the dead and that can be positive, a positive result for each individual, or a negative result. Because if we don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can't have eternal life. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is an historical fact. We either accept it, or we can reject it. The, the, the Lord gives us a choice. And we get to make that choice freely. But in rejecting it, we cast away our hope of eternal life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is our hope of heaven. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, that's my lesson for today. Put it in perspective. I thank you so very much for your time. I thank you so very much for your attention. Listen, if you have a need, please let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation song.